During the period between the late 1970s to the early 1980s, random Japanese citizens were disappearing under unusual circumstances along their coastal cities. North Korea abducted these Japanese citizens for two main reasons. One, they wanted to disguise North Korean Asians to be Japanese citizens. And two, these abducted victims were to be used to teach North Korean Asians the Japanese customs and language so that they could effectively assimilate into Japan. This was called the North Korean Abduction Project program and Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs actually have created reports that outline the circumstances of the victims disappearances, the victims identities, and the steps taken by the Japanese government and the North Korean government after these abductions. You can actually view them on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. Um, I'll link it below if you guys are interested in learning more. But in this video, I'll pretty much outline all of these abductions and what what basically happened afterwards. So Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs have officially identified 12 cases involving 17 victims and of these 17 victims, North Korea has denied responsibility for four of these victims. Of the other 13, they have said that eight of them died under very unusual circumstances like for from a gas accident, from a heart attack, or from car accidents. And five of these victims were actually returned to Japan on October 2002. So I will start outlining these 12 cases according to the timeline of when they disappeared. The first First disappearance occurred on September 17th of 1977 when Kume Yukata, a 52 years old security guard who disappeared off of the coast of Ushitsu, which is a part of Ishikawa Prefecture. North Korea has denied responsibility for this disappearance. They said that he never set foot in North Korea. I have noticed a trend um, when looking through the disappearance cases where North Korea actually denies responsibility for the ones that occurred early on and then for the ones that occurred later on um, like in the early 1980s they have accepted responsibility for them and I think it's because probably the cases that happened early on there was less evidence that directly pointed to North Korea being responsible for them. The second disappearance occurs in the same year, a month later, on October 21st, 1977. Kyoko Matsumoto was 29 years old when she disappeared on her way home from knitting practice in Totoro Prefecture. North Korea has denied that she ever set foot in North Korea. And then in the same year, on November 15th, this is probably the most famous case because it does involve a child. Her name was was Megumi Yokota and Megumi was only 13 years old when she disappeared on her way home from badminton practice in her hometown um, which was located in Nagata prefecture. North Korea actually accepted responsibility for her disappearance and they have claimed that she died from an apparent suicide. I will go into more detail about Megumi's disappearance because we have a lot of information about her and it's the saddest one since she was only 13 years old when it happened happened and her parents have tried really hard to get her back because they believe that she's still alive in North Korea. On the morning of November 15th, 1977, Megumi was hurriedly eating her breakfast with her family and her family consisted of her, her father, her mother, and her twin younger brothers. She was eating breakfast before she left for her junior high school. This was the last time that her family ever saw her. That day, Megumi was supposed to go to school. She was a part of a badminton club and she was supposed to go to practice after school that day and then return home after that. Her house was only about a seven minute walk from the school, so she always walked to and from school. When Megumi didn't come home that night, her parents were searching for her and they had the police involved. They began a very thorough investigation where about 3,000 staff days were put into looking for Megumi. However, there were no witnesses. It was as if she just vanished into thin air. Megumi was described to be a bright and cheerful child. Her family described her to be the son of their family. And she was also pretty tall for her age. She was a really cute girl. She even had dimples when she was young. Aside from badminton, she enjoyed singing and dancing. And she also practiced Japanese 
calligraphy on her free time and she also liked to do ballet dancing. Her father's name was Shigeru Yokota and her mother's name was Seiki and she had younger twin brothers whose names were Takuya and Tetsuya and they were both nine years old at the time of her disappearance. The day before her disappearance was November 14th and it was actually her father's birthday and for his birthday she had given him a comb with a note saying please take good care of your appearance from now on which just gives me the impression that she was such a kind and thoughtful little girl you know like she was basically saying to her dad like i'm older now and i can take care of myself and you don't have to take care of me anymore you can just take care of yourself after her disappearance her father would wake up early every morning and search by the beach and her mother after finishing her house chores she would leave the house and search on the neighboring towns for her and also search on the beach for her as well. Her father would cry alone in the bath and her mother would also cry alone in the bath so then the younger brothers wouldn't hear them crying. They both thought, why do we have to go through such a sad experience? I just want to die already. Her parents did not know this at the time, but here's what we learned about the day of her disappearance later on. While her parents were searching for her, Megumi was actually on a ship that was heading towards North Korea. She had been kidnapped by North Korean agents and blindfolded and thrown onto a boat. She was crying out for her mom in the dark and she was scratching at the walls and the doors so badly that her fingernails were almost coming off and there was blood all over her hands. Megumi's kidnapping was actually unplanned. There were two agents that were completing a spy mission and they were waiting on the shore to be picked up by a boat to go back to North Korea, but they had been seen by somebody from the road. Not wanting to mess their mission up, they grabbed the child and they basically took her with them. When they kidnapped her, they lied to her. They promised her that if she kept quiet and if she was behaving well, they would give her back to her family. However, they never had any intention of returning her. They wanted to use her as a teacher for North Korean Asians and to teach North Korean Asians Japanese customs and Japanese language. Her parents then devoted their lives to making sure that Megumi's name was known to people and they tried really hard to get her back. Her parents and other family members of the abducted victims started an organization called the Association of Families of Victims Kidnapped by North Korea to provide support and to help bring them back. Newspapers and magazines even knew her name and her name was even brought up in the National Diet of Japan, which is Japan's parliament. And for 20 years, they had no clue about what happened to her. And it was on January 21st, 1997, 20 years after her disappearance, that they heard from Pyongyang, which is the capital of North Korea, that Megumi was alive. When they heard that Megumi was alive, they were shocked because this whole time, they just thought that they were never gonna know what happened to their daughter. But their spark was reignited. They contacted news outlets and magazines, try to get her name back out there. In September 17th of 2002, Kim Jong-il apologized for her abduction and he claimed that she died from suicide and that she had hung herself in a pine forest on the grounds of a mental hospital where she was being treated for her depression. And when her mom heard that, she said, in Nagata, we had pine forests. I'm sure she missed them. I'm sure she was very lonely. For a minute, I thought maybe she longed so much for us and she couldn't come back that in an instant, she took her life. I cried. But in the next minute, I said, no, that could not have happened. I do not want it to have happened. I don't want her to have gone through that. This claim was hard to believe because there were a lot of inconsistencies. He said that she died on March 13th of 1994, even though initially he claimed that she died in 1993. There was another woman who was abducted named Fuki Chimura, and Fuki had claimed that she had actually lived next door to Megumi and that Megumi was still alive after 1994 when they said she died. And then in in November 2004, Pyongyang actually gave Megumi's remains to her parents and it was 
a Japanese tradition to keep the umbilical cord. So they had used Megumi's umbilical cord to test against the sample that was received from North Korea. Japan's forensic analysis tested these remains and they found that they did not belong to Megumi. However, the scientists later came out and said that the sample could have been contaminated. So it was basically inconclusive whether or not the sample actually belonged to Megumi or not. We still don't really know if Megumi died or if she is still alive, but it's the thought for a lot of Japanese people that Megumi is still alive and living in North Korea somewhere and that they're not returning her because she knows too much about North Korea's spy missions and she would divulge that information to Japan. And sadly, her father died at 87 years old in 2020, not ever seeing her again, even though he had worked so hard to try to get her back. He died in the hospital with Megumi's picture on his bedside. Currently, her mother, Seiki, is 86 years old and if Megumi ever returns this is what Seiki says she wants to do with her daughter. I want to take Megumi into a very natural place when she returns because I believe that she is living now by doing her best not to make any mistakes while being afraid of wiretaps and hidden cameras in North Korea. I want her to lie spread out on open ground like on a ranch in Hokkaido and let her say I'm free. And then in or around June of 1978, the next year, Tanaka Minoru, who was 28 years old when he disappeared after leaving the airport for Vienna. Originally, North Korea actually denied that they were responsible for his disappearance. But then in 2014, they had informed Japan that he was actually still alive and living in North Korea with his wife, whom he had married after he was abducted into North Korea and he actually had children and he had no plans of returning to Japan since he had a family and children in North Korea. This case was kind of interesting because originally when Japan's government was informed that he was still alive and did not plan on returning to Japan, they had not informed the public that this was his decision because they were worried the public would have a negative reaction to his decision to remain in North Korea. But I do think it makes sense if most of your life has been living in North Korea in a different country and your children and your wife, that's all they know, then um, I mean, it would make more sense to stay there than to return to Japan where they don't know anything about it and they might not be comfortable living in a different country. In the same month, um, June 1978, Yaiko Taguchi, who was 22 years old when she disappeared, Yaiko was a nightclub hostess and she was actually a single mother to two young children one was a baby boy who was only 16 months old when she disappeared and the other child was a three-year-old daughter. Later on, we find out that when Yaeko was abducted into North Korea, she was renamed Lee eun and she was forced to train North Korean spies. We do learn a lot from the former North Korean agent Kim hyung kwe because she was a bomber of the North Korean Flight 858 and she was questioned by Japanese authorities. She told them that Yaiko was her teacher at the North Korean spy school. This claim was also later corroborated by another abducted victim. Although North Korea claims that she died from a car accident, the former North Korean agent does not think that this is true because she spoke to a driver in 1987 who claimed that Yaiko was still alive. And this occurred one year after North Korea claimed that she died. Yaiko's son was actually adopted by her brother and her daughter was adopted by an aunt. Her son grew up actually not even knowing that he was adopted. He had no idea that Yaiko was his mother until he was about 22 years old when he was applying for a job. The job required him to travel abroad. So in order to acquire his passport, he had to look through his family registration papers to which he found that he was adopted and he was actually very sure shocked that the secret had been kept from him for so many years. When he found out that he was adopted, his adopted dad or his biological uncle actually took him out for lunch where he told him the truth about his biological mother and that Yaiko was his sister. It is quite sad because he grew up not knowing anything about his mother and he also doesn't even remember what she looks like because he was so young when she was abducted. After this, there was a string of abductions involving couples. I'm not sure why they did this, but they tend to abduct a lot of couples or pairs. On July 7th, 1970, 
1978. This was the first disappearance of a couple. The couple's names were Yasushi and Fuki Chimura. The couple were both 23 years old when they disappeared after going on a date in Fukui Prefecture. At the time, Fuki was Yasushi's fiance and they later got married after their abduction into North Korea. In North Korea, they had had three children together. Fortunately, this couple was one of the few people who were actually returned to Japan in October 2002. An interesting point is that the couple actually returned to Japan and then their children at the time were still living in North Korea and were returned to them um, three years later. They are both still alive and they are now currently 67 years old. At the end of the same month, on July 31st, 1978, another couple had disappeared. This couple consisted of Kaoru Hasuike, who was 20 years old, and Yukiko Okudo, who was 22 years old and they were abducted from Niigata Prefecture. Kaoru was a college student and the couple had decided to go watch the sunset on the beach the night they disappeared. They had told people that they were going to be back before disappearing. This was also one of the couples that were returned to Japan. This is what happened to them the day they disappeared. So while the couple were walking on the beach, there were several strange men who were walking nearby that they thought were visitors. One of the men had approached Kaoru and asked him for a light for his cigarette. When Kaoru helped the man light his cigarette, he was struck in the head and then bound, gagged, and thrown into a large bag. Yukiko was abducted in the same manner and stuffed into another large bag. They were then loaded onto an inflatable boat that took them out to the sea onto a larger ship. They were also drugged and then told that if they remained silent, they would not be harmed. This ship took them to North Korea where they remained for 24 years before being returned to Japan in 2002. The couple is now still alive. Kaoru is now 65 years old and Yukiko is 67 years old currently. And then a third couple disappeared on August 12th of 1978. They disappeared from Kagoshima Prefecture. The couple's names were Shuiki Ishikawa who was 23 years old and Rumiko Matsumoto who was 24 years old at the time of their disappearance. Rumiko was an office clerk, and when they went missing, her car was found locked with her wallet and camera still inside, and Shuichi's sandals were found near the water's edge on the beach. Like the previous couple, they had also gone out to watch the sunset on the beach when they disappeared. Unfortunately for this couple, they were not returned alive to Japan. North Korea had claimed that they both died of heart attacks, Ichikawa, while he was swimming in the ocean. Rumiko's younger brother, whose name is Teruaki Matsumoto, described her as being a very loving and caring sister. He said, quote, she was very kind to me since our family was wasn't so affluent. We lived in one room with a family of six. Rumiko and I slept on the same futon until I was about 12 years old. She loved me so much. When I got scolded by our father, she cried and defended me. And you can see in this photo that Teruaki still wears the watch that his sister had given him when he got accepted into university so many years ago. Teruaki had said this, if their deaths were proven, then we would want their bones to be back with us. That's the Japanese mentality. We would also continue to hold the Japanese government accountable for not being able to rescue the abductees. Then on August 12th, 1978, a mother and daughter were abducted. The mother, whose name was Miyoshi Soga, she was 46 years old. Her daughter was Hitomi Soga, who was 19 years old at the time of their abduction. They were abducted in Nagata Prefecture on the same date as the couple previously. The pair had disappeared after going out to do some shopping. According to Hitomi, they had stopped for some ice cream on their way home after doing some shopping. When they were approached by these three men, they were bound and gagged and placed into large bags. Then Hitomi was carried onto a boat and taken to North Korea. Luckily, Hitomi was one of the five people who were returned to Japan, and sadly for her, she has not seen her mother ever since they disappeared and were abducted. At this time, her mother's whereabouts are unknown. Also, North Korea denies that her mother was ever in North Korea. Then in May of 1980, two men disappeared together. These two men were named Toru 
Ishioka and Toru Matsuki. Unlike the other victims, they actually disappeared during their time in Europe. Toru was 22 years old at the time and Kaoru was 26 years old. North Korea has accepted responsibility for abducting the two men and they claim that Toru died in a gas accident while Kaoru, they claim that he died in a car accident. Then in the middle of June 1980, Tadaki Hara, who was 43 years old, disappeared in Miyazaki Prefecture. North Korea claims that he died from cirrhosis of the liver and interestingly North Korea says that he got married to Yaeko, the single mother from, from before, and the last official incident occurred around July 1983 where Keiko Arimoto, who was 23 years old and was also abducted while she was in Europe. North Korea claimed that she also died from a gas accident. Aside from these 17 official victims, the Japanese government claims that there are 873 other victims where North Korean involvement could not be ruled out. According to the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights, who reported in February of 2014 that these abductions not only occurred in Japan, but also occurred in South Korea, Thailand, Lebanon, Malaysia, Singapore, Romania, France, Italy, Netherlands, and also China. So this is not only a concern for the Japanese government, but other countries as well. And the reason why the Japanese government does not believe North Korea when they claim that these victims died from things such as like gas accidents or like car accidents is that North Korea apparently has a population of about 20 million people and there are only 30,000 cars in the country which makes it like one of the lowest rates of like car ownership in the world and it'd probably be pretty rare for a citizen to own a car nevertheless die from a car accident. The reason why North Korea probably is not returning some of these victims is because they're scared that these victims could divulge some North Korean information to Japan. I want to give an idea of the political climate and the background of what was occurring at the time that North Korea was carrying out these abductions. So Kim Il-sung was North Korea's first ruler and founder. He was active during the Korean War and he ruled from 1948 to 1994. When he passed away from a heart attack in 1994, his son Kim Jong-il took over and became the chairman of North Korea. This marked the beginning of the world's first communist dynasty. It was during Kim Il-sung's reign that these cases were happening. While he was still in power, he denied North Korea's involvement in any of these abductions. And it was only after he died and his son took over that North Korea actually accepted responsibility for some of these abductions. It could be that North Korea wanted aid from Japan as well as maybe they wanted to be on good terms with Japan in a sense because in 1991 North Korea underwent a severe economic collapse and then from 1994 to 1998 there was the North Korean famine and we're not sure about the number of deaths but it ranged from about 240,000 people all the way up to 3.5 million people. Kim Jong-il wanted aid, investment, and an apology from Japan for the colonization of Korea in exchange for information about these abductions. And not to excuse North Korea's actions, but it does shed some light into why they did some of the things they did. Historically, there's been a lot of tension between North Korea and Japan. Korea was under Japanese rule for a about 35 years up until the end of World War II. While they were under Japanese rule, about 100,000 men were sent to serve in the Japanese Imperial Army and about 200,000 Japanese women and young children, like girls, um, aged about 12 and up until like about 20 years old, they were sent to the Japanese Imperial Army to be used as comfort women, aka sex slaves. And North Korea was still very angry about the fact that this happened. And because of these actions, Kim Il-sung actually led an independence movement and later founded what is now known as North Korea. The Japanese government I know has tried to hide the fact that 
there were comfort women. They still deny the fact that these women were being used as sex slaves. Since then, North Korea and Japan have had really bad relations, even to the point where they have had to have discussions to normalize their relationship. I wanted to go through a timeline of events of what um, the Japanese government did and their interactions with North Korea after these abductions. When these abductions initially started happening, they were occurring under very unusual circumstances. And once they questioned questioned defected North Korean agents, they got a lead that North Korea was responsible for the disappearance of these victims. For one, the location of the disappearance of these victims was suspicious because a lot of them occurred on beaches, which makes sense because they could travel by boat to these areas and then after abducting the victims, they could wait by the coast for a getaway. Japan first brought up the issue to North Korea in 1991, but the government repeatedly denied these accusations. In September 2002, when Kim Jong-il was the chairman of North Korea, um, North Korea and Japan had their first summit where they discussed these abductions. It was here that North Korea had admitted for the first time that they were responsible for these abductions. More specifically, Kim Jong-il said that 13 out of these 17 victims identified by Japan was directly abducted by North Korea. And of the 13, five were alive and eight were dead. North Korea said that they could not return the remains of the eight people that they said were dead because the floods had washed away a lot of the graves. One month later in October 2002 was when North Korea had returned the five victims to Japan. By this time, it had been about 24 years since the victims had been abducted. And originally, it was actually meant to be a short stay, but the Japanese government had no intentions of returning these victims back to North Korea, and rightly so. And then in May 2004, there was a second North Korea-Japan summit where North Korea agreed that they would conduct full investigations into what happened to these victims. After 2004, there were meetings held in 2006, 2007, 2008, where the government of Japan kept on bringing up the issue of these abductions and they wanted to know more and they wanted full reports of what happened to these victims. And it was really frustrating because every time North Korea agreed that they would look into the issue again, they would take a step back backwards and be like, okay, it's resolved. Or they would also, um, in 2008, when Japan's prime minister suddenly resigned, North Korea was like, okay, we'll wait to see what your new prime minister does before we look into these cases again. So it was very frustrating for Japan, as well as the families of these victims who just really wanted to, you know, see their loved ones again, or like, have their loved ones remains back with them. In 2014, North Korea had agreed to open a new investigation involving the eight victims that they had claimed to be deceased. Sadly, this investigation was canceled in 2016 when Japan declared that they would take measures against North Korea after they launched some ballistic missiles. Since then, there have been campaigns to help get the abductees home and there was a petition signed by more than 15 million Japanese people um, to help the victims of these abductions. It is still an issue to this date and it's now becoming more of an urgent issue now more than ever because the victims family members have started to age and pass away and they really just want to see their loved ones come home and you know have their loved ones remains returned to them. I think for the family members, it's also very sad, like knowing that your loved one could be detained or be suffering a terrible fate in a country that's, you know, not too far away, but then you can't do anything about it. And the government is unable to do much about it either because, you know, there's only so much to do when it comes to political affairs. And sadly, only two of the victim's parents remain alive. The Japanese government still considers the issue to be unresolved, and they would not consider it resolved until three things are complete. Number one, the safety of all abductees must be secured and they must be returned to Japan immediately. Number two, North Korea must give a full account of the truth regarding all abduction cases. And then number three, North Korea must hand over to Japan the persons who carried out the abductions. And I want to end this video with an excerpt written by Seiki's mother. Um, she wrote this to Megumi a 
bit before her husband's death. She said, Dear Megumi, we don't have that much time left. We fought so long and hard with our hearts and souls, but we cannot hold out much longer. I want to celebrate my next birthday with you. Only the nation of Japan, the government, can make that happen. But sometimes I'm overcome with a sense of unease and concerned that our efforts are futile when I see what's going on in our government. I doubt they have the will to solve this problem and figure out a way to bring the victims home. Somehow, I've managed to survive this raging storm. I am thankful that you have also survived, supported by a greater power. We are not alone, and so I pray again today as I think of all of you. It will take more effort than ever before to bring all the victims back to Japan, of course. Japan must stand up for itself, but we also need courage, love, and righteousness from all around the world. Those of you who read my letter, please take a moment to remember in your heart the abductees so trapped in North Korea. Please speak out for them. Dearest Megumi, I will keep up the fight to bring you back home to me, your father, and your brothers, Takuya and Tatsuya. My resolve remains unshaken, even at age 84. So please take care of yourself and never lose hope. Thank you for watching and I hope this can get the word out there and to spread awareness about the issue.